Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be answering a question that I've gotten a bunch of times and that is how are you able to learn the ins and outs of a new airplane? Now what's super cool about this today is um, I'm going to be using the Mooney as kind of my victim and I'm going to be going through 10 different things that I do. Obviously there's more than one way to kind of learn a new airplane but I'll kind of show you sort of the workflow that I use you know when I'm preparing videos or I'm in the real world and I'm trying to you know get the hang of a brand new airplane. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing that would be on my list, and uh, this is uh, one of those that should be, you know, might be a little nerdy, but I think it's great, is to study the POH of the aircraft itself. Uh, one of the great things out there is um, you can literally go on Google and search things. You know, if I type in M20R POH, for example, I notice right at the top, uh, there it is, Mooney 20R Ovation POH, and here is the actual handbook to flying this aircraft. It even says FA approved right at the top. Now, when you're reading through these, I mean, there's different people who have uh, different kinds of opinions and what kind of depth here. Um, when you're learning a plane in the real world, uh, pretty much every plane had to be checked out for. I have to read this thing cover to cover and answer test questions on it. So don't be surprised if you need to know that. And again, a lot of times for the flight sim, you probably don't have to go into that much detail. And now, of course, for those of you who do the airliners, you've probably seen the FCOMs, which are these very thick 1,200 page uh, terrifying manuals. You don't need to read the whole thing, but hey, it's uh, the more you know, kind of a thing like that. Um, one thing I always like to tell people with the POH manuals uh, when you're first studying them, and so there's going to be a lot of stuff in here that is kind of the what versus the how. And uh, you want to kind of keep that in mind that in the flight sim, the what is not as important as the how. Now, I know you mean like, what? Well, just as a quick example here, uh, let's take a look. Let's see, we're a number of engines. One, we're a continental motors. We have an IO550 G5 of the last, you know, a bunch of uh, temperature limitations, stuff like that. This is all great to know, but it's not as important as actually coming down here and studying things like what happens if the landing gear do not extend. Uh, you know, this is something that's much more interesting. Most POHs for general aviation aircraft uh, generally are written in the same style where you kind of have all your kind of uh, standard emergencies and then you get into the actual let's go kind of a thing. Keep in mind, a lot of airplane developers like the different companies who make the different airplanes that you fly around in flight sim will provide you with their own simple version of a POH. But you really do want to take some time and go through this and just familiarize yourself with it. Um, you're not going to memorize everything. You can't. You have to use the plane a lot to be able to kind of really get the hang of it. But coming down here, for example, when starting engine, I'd use the da -da 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 -da. it even gives you an entire detailed list of how you're supposed to start this engine. You know, uh, you can definitely tell the people who read it versus the people who don't by, you know, what procedures they use. The next thing, and this would be my number two here, is it's always worth poking around and seeing real world videos on an aircraft. Uh, we have an M20R, obviously, and it got some people throwing some flight sims. Watch out for the flight sim stuff. Um, you know, this is coming from a person who does a lot of flight sim stuff. Uh, I would not trust it as much as seeing somebody actually flying the plane, especially if you got something a little bit unique. But um, a lot of times what you'll do is, you know, get some different videos. People do walk arounds. And sometimes when you see something in the real world, it's going to make more sense to you when you get inside the simulator. You know, this guy's got a whole thing about weight and breadth, which is excellent information. And there's a ton, obviously, like I said, there's some reviews in here for flight sim. Watch out for the flight sim stuff. It's not the same. And again, obviously the flight sim is going to be different, but it's worth seeing why all these different aircraft are like this. Even little things like this, where you can see the difference in size between the individual and the person who's flying it. So um, I always find these things to be really, really interesting and just sound effect wise and sometimes procedurally. You have to take what you see in some of these videos a little bit cautiously though, because like again, you've got a POH that tells you the book way, and then a lot of people will have kind of their own way. And again, there's also the flight simulator way, which usually doesn't typically care as much as far as things along those guys' line. But that being said, it's super fun to see the way these actually handle and they actually sound before getting into the simulator. It just makes them that much more interesting. All right, so this would be my number three item to learning a new plane. Take some time to do the full checklist from one end to the other, from all the way from startup all the way to shut down. A lot of times when I will do this, I will actually go through and I will go through each step individually. Uh, like for example, for this aircraft, I'm supposed to stick that in. We're gonna stick the blue handle in all the way. We're gonna put the mixture control all the way in. We're gonna flip on our master switch, which is gonna be located over on this particular side. Uh, we're gonna make sure the alternator's on. We're gonna get all sorts of angry warning lights. You know, we can come up here and press the test to make sure the lights all start. You know, we've got a low fuel boost pump switch. You know, we can come over here. That's our high boost switch. Uh, we want our low boost switch, which is going to be right here. Uh, we're going to make sure that boosts up. We'll come back to the idle position. You know, we come look out the window. We make sure everything's clear. And you, know, you go ahead and set the starter with the moment that it engages and go ahead and get this aircraft uh, cranking up to full power. Like going through all those little pieces and then experiencing them yourself, especially if you've had the chance to see them online, it just makes everything click just a little bit 
bit better and makes it just half more realistic. The other thing too is aircraft that are more complicated, oh, this in my opinion is not the most complicated airplane, but when you get to more complicated aircraft later on, going through all the motions will actually save you a lot of frustration later on when you realize, oh, you had to open that, otherwise the engine shuts off, or oh, why did all my batteries shut off halfway through the flight? Oh, the reason is because you never turned on the generator, the alternator. But again, going through that entire procedure, even if you do it the first five or six flights before you start pressing control E, really helps you understand why the aircraft behaves. And when things do not go well, it gives you the ability to kind of go back. Now, the next step is an interesting one that a lot of times we can't get away with so much in the real world, and that is to play with the buttons. Now, I know that sounds funny, but one of the cool things is with a flight simulator is it gives you the ability to play with the buttons without fear of damaging something. And that's one of the things I always really, 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 really enjoy about you know flight sims is we can have some fun. I kid you not, when I'm learning a new plane, I'll do things, I'll come over here, I'll press this button a bunch of times and figure, which one's this? Okay, so that's changing, all right, all right. Okay, that doesn't seem to change. Let me press, press control, okay. So it's like a VCR, all right, master switch, do, do, do. All right, I've got all my fuels. Uh, do they actually behave though? You know, I'll come in here, let's try to empty this fuel tank. You know, does the fuel uh, gauge respond the way that I expect it to? You know, I can see that this is 23. I increase it and watch it happen in flight. Give it some power, watch all my numbers get bigger, pull it back, watch the numbers get smaller. Um, you know, playing around with the RPM control, you know, I'll push the RPM, let's do, whoop, let's go ahead and put our parking brake there. Go up to a 20 inches of mercury here, and now we'll go ahead and pull back the RPM handle. Let's see how much of an impact it has. Wow, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Push that one back forward, give it full throttle, pull it back. Um, you know, I'll do things like I'll come in here, I'll grab the mixture control, and I'll do little silly things like this, and how far back before it stops flying. Oh no, I still have control. You know, you can get it up to like absurdly high temperatures. Oh, I'll pull this handle back, you know, just kind of going through the motions. Study each one of the instruments. A lot of times when you look at an instrument, you realize they have numbers on them you've never used, such as true airspeed calculation. Like you can actually set and get true airspeed on it. You know, you can come down here, you've got the little fuel fuel computer, you know, playing around with this. How much gallons have I used so far? Does this actually work? And I go to enter mode, you know, taking a look at the buttons going like this, you know, little holes down here for the purposes of uh, plugging in your headphones. You know, you got your big old oxygen switch here. You know, does the oxygen switch make happy noises? You know, if I set them bright, you know, where am I comfortable with the lights are, you know, poking above my head. Um, is it going to be oak set for uh, my different lights? So what does the recognition light even mean? Do I turn this one on, come around the back? Look, is it flashing? What light did I just turn on kind of a thing? Oh no, what have I done? You know, coming down here, trying to tune in the radios, you know, sitting here, setting a specific frequency, making sure the CDI behaves. Uh, for example, uh, which one of these two instruments displays NAV1? In this particular case, our HSI is NAV1. This is actually NAV2. They're not a duplicate of each other. Knowing that, you try to put the landing gear up while you're on the ground. You see if anything bad happens. Oh, nope, nothing. It beeps at you an awful lot. What's the deal with that? Uh, coming down here, uh, setting the altitude alerter, you know, what if I set it to negative altitude, set this to this and press the arm button, you know, do I get any new enunciators that kind of pop up on this side? You know, how do I switch from GPS mode to nav mode? I see that there's multiple switches here. You know, if I wanted to listen to ATIS, uh, what button would I push? Does the speaker, oh, oh, look at this. I can do pilot isolation. I thought, oh, no, test doesn't work. Marker mute, I'll turn that one back on. We have a music crew mode. Uh, we can come float over here to the ELT. I can turn the ELT on. It starts flashing. Uh, theoretically, if the ELT is working, I should be able to go like this and get deafened. By deafened, it's not so much deafened as it is beep, 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 beep. I call it this guy, please. <laughs> I'm not sure what that beeping noise is, <laughs> but that's actually very realistic. I'll play with the ADF, play with the automatic pilot, I'm making sure I understand how the transponder works. You know, a lot of planes, some of these actually work. So you can come over here and you can actually switch batteries. You can pop out some of the circuit breakers. I have this little guy right here, which is another map light. How do I turn it on? Oh, so I rock the switch with my middle, my mouse wheel. You know, I've got the little tablet. And if you're dealing with a Carinado airplane, you know, I can unlock the door. I can close the door. You know, I can do all these sorts of things. And it's just a matter of playing with the aircraft itself. Like I said, it's really worthwhile to fits with it to try to get a feel with all the different settings is. So the most important thing that I like to do with the flight comes up next. And what that is, is putting the plane through its paces. Now, one of the things in the early days of flying, you get in, you do a bunch of landings. All right, I've learned the plane. But I found one of the best ways to learn about the plane and kind of learn how it functions and sort of the way to handle is to put it through a group of different maneuvers in order to sort of kind of feel the different performances of the plane. You know, what makes it different? How do I know X, Y, and Z? So the first thing I always like to do is I like to fly the plane in slow flight installs in different conditions. 
So one of the things you learn real quickly, for example, is I notice if I pull the throttle out, I get that beeping noise to tell me my landing gear is not down. So I'm actually going to drop the landing gear is to try flying the plane very slow in different configurations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and slow my plane way down. I'm actually going to cheat a little bit, suck some energy out of the plane here. And there we go. That looks like a pretty good altitude. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fly the plane nice and slow with just the landing gear deployed. And what I'm feeling here is I want to know what this airplane is like at low speeds. You know, if I'm coming in for landing, what does it look like out the front of the plane? You know, I'm doing about 66, 67 knots right now. You know, how much throttle is it going to take me to keep at this attitude? You know, what point is the plane not going to want to fly again? Once you pull the plane down this slow, this is a great way to see how accurately they modeled the particular plane. In this case, uh, you can see I'm still climbing and I'm basically below stall speed. You know, one thing I can do here is uh, theoretically I should be stalled, by the way, is you can now turn the plane. What does it feel like? How far back? Oh, did you see that coming? Notice it was a sudden break to the stall. I was not expecting it to just dump like that. That was a very, 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 very aggravated kind of a stall. That, that literally, I'm surprised. So, you know, what I would do is I'd fly it very, very slow in that configuration. Then what I would do is throw it into landing configuration, which I've just done. And then I'd fly it at the same kind of condition. And I'd try to feel what looks different. Look up the nose, for example. Do you see that the nose seems to be higher? Or do you see that the nose seems to be lower? Oh, so we stalled at a lower airspeed that time. And there's the secondary stall. And you can see that that same sudden drop hit, but it just hit at a lower speed. So what I would do is I'd fly it at slow speed like that for a while, and I can already tell you this aircraft is kind of dangerous. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to full landing configuration, and we're going to see if there's any differences. So I'm at full throttle right now, and I'm also doing five or six under my stall speed. So I can tell you already, this aircraft has a massive, massive elevator authority. I'm doing 50 knots, and that is significantly below my stall speed. Oh, there he goes. And there's the actual brake itself. And you can see that brake almost always leads to a secondary stall and a loss of about 300 feet. So in that quick set of maneuvers, again, flying with different flap levels, I can already tell you there's a pretty significant difference between full flaps and no flaps. So what I'll do is I'll deal with the incessant beeping here. I get a little warning there, my master caution, that's fine. And now we're going to fly not in landing configuration. And we're just going to see what the plane wants to do. Whoop, does not care for that at all. And that secondary stall is very distinctive always to the left. So in doing that, what I'm doing is I'm identifying what this plane can and cannot do pretty much right away. Other things we like to do too is um, we go ahead and make the situation a little bit more dangerous. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and establish myself in a perfect landing condition here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I forgot to set my RPM correctly. So let's go ahead and pull my RPM out a lot. So let's go ahead and pretend we're coming in for landing. Coming in, you know, the plane's starting to get slow. I'll go ahead and pull back on the stick a little bit. Get nice and slow. Oh, we better go take off. I give it full throttle. I'm not climbing. Push the RPM up. Hey, there we go. So we can see in that case, uh, for example, you know, this aircraft is not overpowered. I could not overwhelm my problem. Uh, basically, I could see that with all the situations, go slap the gear up. That always helps to reduce drag. We could see that now that I know that when I land this plane, if I'm not at full RPM, I run the risk of not being able to fly myself out of that extremely distinctive region of reversal that's going to be distinctive when we go to pop the thing on the ground a little later on. Next thing I like to do with these aircraft after I've run them through a bunch of, again, try every different condition, flaps up, flaps down, gear down, different speeds, different things. I like to experiment with the aircraft as far as from a maneuverability perspective. But one of the first things I like to check is if I come down here and I look at my turn coordinator is I jam the aileron to one side and I'm interested to see how responsive the plane is. So in that case, I noticed the ball kind of snuck over to the right a little bit, snap it to the left, you can see it snapped a lot, but it is a very, very responsive, but it's also a late handling airplane. So I'll go ahead and hit the rudder this time. And I notice exactly, I need full rudder to compensate for full aileron, aileron. And I can already see I've got the aircraft completely upside down, but you can see that that sensitivity is very, very real, which now means when I'm coming in for a landing, you know, I was breaking that spot on the ground, I know exactly how much rudder it's going to require in order to snap myself in. The other thing I'm interested in is when I take my turn, how much energy am I gaining or losing? 
you know, if I put this aircraft into a nice steep turn like this and I tug on the stick, how fast am I losing speed here? Keep in mind, I'm at full throttle also. You know, I'm sitting here, sitting here, sitting here. I'm at 90 knots. I'm losing a little tiny bit of altitude. Am I still in coordination? Mostly, but it's really losing speed. And I'm also noticing that the aircraft is starting to threaten me with stall. So I'm actually gonna pull back just a little less. There we go. And I'm just feeling the way the aircraft goes. And what you wanna do is toss yourself back in the other direction. You're gonna gain a bunch of altitude if you're not quick about it. And we just go the other way. I can already tell you this aircraft has a definite kind of touchiness to it that is very distinctive to it. And as you're getting the handle of maneuvering it, you just have to remember to use a little bit less force than you think you need to. I'll come out of it, finish up my turn, see exactly what that's like. After you do all that, you know, again, slow flight stalls, consider strange conditions. For example, um, if this aircraft immediately lost an engine, let's go ahead and do that. Um, how's the plane glide? You know, no engine, everything is that cutting out there. The propeller should stop spinning in just a second here. Um, what is my glide speed supposed to be? Uh, this particular aircraft is going to be right around 80. So let's get it to 80. And now just look out the window. How fast am I losing altitude? Um, am I losing altitude like tons and tons? Am I uh, sliding out of control here? Look down, I'm losing 400, about 500 feet per minute. That's nothing. That's like almost like a glider as far as that performance goes here. You know, how does this aircraft handle? Remember, we spent all that time while working with all those different slow flights. I know that I now have a much, much safer time as I want to kind of set myself up for this major highway here to come and land. And I can see I'm barely losing any altitude here. I'm actually going to let the plane pick up just a tiny bit. So of course, uh, we don't want to sit here and I'll lose the engine completely. So let's go ahead and get that sucker started back up there and see how long does it take to recover. So when I'm first learning a new plane, I spend a pretty significant amount of time just messing with it. If it's a stunt plane, I do really basic stunts and kind of build it up. If it's a GA plane, I want to know how it handles in all different conditions. That's just going to make things a little bit different. So now the next one uh, that I like to do on number six on my list, eh, it's pretty predictable. So our sixth item, and this is the important one, is landing the aircraft in different conditions. Every aircraft, it doesn't matter how big, how small, has something about it when it lands that makes it unique. You know, there's not one landing technique. I mean, there's one basic, you know, philosophy of landing techniques, if you want to think about it another way. Obviously, land of the back tires. But every airplane has a very distinctive kind of approach. They have a different a way of holding on to energy when you start your flare. Uh, they have a different responsibility when you start getting yourself into a situation where you're getting a little bit slow. Some aircraft, you have to do the airliner, where basically you go over the end of the runway, then pull the throttle back. Uh, some aircraft, like a 152 or 172, you have to kind of coast it in. Uh, some aircraft like this one, you have a weird combination of power on and letting it coast because the flaps do nothing. Um, you also have different situations as far as landing gear. You know, if you're in a Cessna 182, for example, uh, your landing gear, um, you're going to be really careful with the front nose. You're going to have to pull the nose back past eight or nine degrees in order to safely land the plane. Um, for example, if you're landing a tail dragger, you know, when you're coming in for an approach, are we going to do a two wheel? Does the plane land two wheel better? So the best way to do that is to land the plane a lot. Now you can see here, I'm coming in with a little bit of power. It's about 75 knots. Uh, you can take a look at the uh, little white, red, red over there on the end. So we're coming in fast, but now we're about on glide slope where we want to be. So now I should be able to just lift the nose up and just kind of reduce it and kind of get back down to my 75 there. And again, take a look at the POH. There will be recommendations. In this particular aircraft, we're supposed to be hitting specific speeds, basically 70 knots over the fence kind of a thing. That looks pretty good. We're just a little on the high side for landing on the big 2-3, but that's okay. Speed's good. Uh, for our first landing, we'll land with power on a little bit, just in case. We'll interrupt the descent rate just a little bit. And we're going to pull the throttle back a little bit. And all we're going to do is hold that nose attitude. And we're going to let the plane figure out what it needs to do. Does it sink on you? Does it drop on you? Does it come down really good? Does the wheel want to hammer down hard when you first come down? What does that expression feel like? So now after you've kind of gotten the hang out of one of the landings, what I actually like to do is I like to create different conditions for the landings to try to feel it out. So in this case, I'm going to give myself a full throttle here, and then I'm going to go use the slew tool. <laughs> One of the great things about the flight sim is you can go in here and you can just do this a hundred times. You can even save your game out here if you have to. Just a little on the low side there. So now what we'll do is I'll go ahead and pause real fast, and I'll actually change the condition to make it so that it's a little different outside. So let's go in here. I didn't realize I was using live weather here. <laughs> Figures. 
So now we can come in here. Let's see, we're coming in uh, 210. So now I can come into the uh, different wind patterns here. We can make it coming from, let's make it a true crosswind here. We'll make it come out of 120 because I'm a terrible person. 120, uh, we know that the wind speed maximum on this one is 11 knots. Uh, 120, uh, we don't need any gusts to 11. Well, that would be terrible. We'll deal. So again, we've got ourselves a pure crosswind. What does the aircraft feel like now? So let's go ahead and unpause. Whoa, I think I did speed up instead of unpause. Let's go ahead and pop the flaps down to the appropriate position. Now we're dealing with a wind from our left ear. So what is this aircraft going to behave like? You know, we've already practiced, you've probably done 10, 15 individual landings um, just to a normal kind of approach and you know, kind of a headwind with standard winds and everything like that. Now, what happens on a crosswind with this aircraft? What feels to be the kind of direct technique? Now, I can tell you already that is a very powerful crosswind because I'm not like in slow motion or anything here, but look at how powerful it's kind of shifting me off to the left here, or the right here. So what we'll do is we'll use standard techniques, finding myself with the runway. We're gonna use some right foot. We're gonna use some left aileron on here. We're gonna set myself up into a wing low configuration and we're just gonna see what the aircraft is like. You know, got a little bit of those gusts. I can already tell you the aircraft, because it's slipping, is losing speed a lot faster than uh, the plane was earlier. So I'll line myself up with that number. We're starting to get a little low, but ironically, a little low is almost correct for this runway for us because we're a little tiny plane. You also want to keep your speed up so that you can maintain positive directional control here. Oh boy, that's that, that's pretty significant. <laughs> My right foot is about 50% of the way there. All right, we'll come in here. They always teach you, uh, we got to get that left wheel down first. And that's the left wheel, right wheel. And we're going to come, whoa! Sorry, people who have headphones. Whoa! That could have been a prop strike if I didn't catch that in time. So, whoa. Again, if I hadn't practiced a crosswind and I just jumped into this and did it, I wouldn't have known that the plane likes to do that. You know, until you're firmly on the ground and under control, it's actually very difficult after you get on the ground. And like, that was a wonderful example. Again, sorry for deafening everybody. So the other thing we want to do too is, like I said, try it in different conditions, different runway, different surfaces to try to get the hang of it. Now, the next one is a little weird. Now, the next thing I like to do when learning an airplane is I like to play with it in different conditions. So what I will do is uh, just as an example, let's take this aircraft and uh, let's go ahead and set the temperature to be 100 degrees on the Fahrenheit scale here. Uh, 100 sounds good. Let's go ahead and also set the weight to be max gross. So let's set it 100%. 100%. Ugh. <laughs> let's go ahead and uh, pop those wing flaps up into the correct position. And let's take off. Here we go. Ooh, looks like somebody's landing at the same time I'm taking off, but that's all right. That's what happens when you leave all players set. Oh, yeah, we're ripping. Oh, we're ripping. Y'all just jealous. We're ripping. Oh my gosh, is this thing going to take off or are we just going to sit here just kind of thinking about taking off? Well, it's 50 knots, so we're slowly starting to go. We're starting to get ourselves up to 60 knots. All right, let's go ahead and lift that front nose off the ground. Oh my gosh. Okay then, I'm nervous now. I don't know that we're going to get airborne. All right, let's see here. Um, uh, I guess I'll clean the plane up. Bring that notch of flaps up, and we'll hold about 80 knots here, which is going to be about our VY. And I'm getting, let's call it, and we're getting some climb. What am I saying? This is like Cessna 1. Oh, no, faster than that. Cessna 182 climb right here. And you can see that, you know, this is what the aircraft feels like when you're in this condition. And of course, what I would do is I'd come back around and try landing it. But to demonstrate how different a plane can be, we'll go ahead and try it again in different conditions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the outside air temperature to be 10 degrees. Oh, that's cold. Uh, zero, can we do zero humidity? I can't lower the humidity less than one. Oh, I can't make the air nice and crisp for you. And the other thing we'll do is we'll go ahead and lighten the plane up. So let's do fuel. Let's go ahead and say for some reason we have anti-passengers. And let's go ahead and say we're carrying 10 gallons of gas, which is... Ugh, that would be scary. Kill the parking brake. Let's try it again. Oh my, that's different. Oh, that's touchy. Like the whole plane is like, whoa, all of a sudden. It's minus 18 on the C scale. That, that's cold enough. Let's see. There's 60, 65. Lift the nose. Gear up. Maybe 
me just get rid of the flaps right away. And this thing is handling like it's an extra 300. It's completely different. And I'm even looking down and I'm noticing the plane is totally in slip now because it's just going so much quicker. Uh, taking a look at my climb rate, I'm actually not even at VY and I'm doing, oh, what do we got? 2,000 feet per minute. So I'm going to go ahead and stand right on the top of this. This is sweet. Look at that. I pinned the vertical speed indicator and I'm only now getting to my VY. So that is a totally, totally different aircraft. In experimenting with the different weights of an airplane, you're going to learn a lot about flying and you're also going to learn a lot about, you know, kind of how you have to manipulate things. We could probably overstress the airplane just going like this now. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> probably not the best idea. Wow. That's, that's different. So the next one is kind of cool as well. So the next thing I like to do after I've got myself comfortable with landing, uh, with different properties of the airplane, you know, experimenting with different fuels. Speaking of different fuels, we should probably put the fuel and the weight back into the plane. There we go. Um, thing, I like to go ahead and take a look at emergencies that are unique to the airplane. Each airplane has a uh, set of emergencies. You know, obviously an engine out is an engine out no matter what airplane you have. But one of the cool things is, is using the unique emergencies to a specific airplane. Now, different airplanes kind of have different ways of handling things. So, for example, if we have landing gear that don't go down, uh, we actually in the real world have this little press to release thing sitting right here. You push the thing, pop it up, click it to the right, and then pump it up a bunch of times and go ahead and deal with it. But all the different emergencies that we can simulate are actually pretty effective. You know, the classic one is, what if we have an engine out? Okay, that's one thing. Now, let's go ahead and create an interesting emergency and see what we can do. Let's go ahead and create, uh, let's see, an overcast. Uh, that's not that scary, actually. Let's uh, make this a little bit more interesting. There we go. That's pretty good. And we have an electrical failure. Okay, so now we could go ahead and practice an emergency and go ahead and figure out what we would do in the real world. So now, um, I don't know about you, but if all my electrical systems went out, first thing I would do is grab my POH, get the plane nice and straight and level, like I can see I've got a 500 feet per minute descent, and start going onto instrument. Just hang on to whatever it is you're doing. Take your time mode. Okay, we're in no rush here. Just, we still have air underneath us. There's no reason to rush anything. There's no reason to panic yet. You can start, you can get a little stressed. Okay, let's get out the checklist. All right, so let's see here. The electrical systems have failed. Uh, possibilities, uh, did you press the switch? Uh, let's see here. Oh, I pressed the switch. Oh, there's my electrical emergency. Ah, everything's fine. Oh, oh uh-oh, my avionics cut out. All right, let's go through and see here. So my next item is, did you shut the avionics off? Oh, oh, I did, okay, whoops, turned it off. Oh, my avionics went back off again. Oh, well, let me go check my circuit breakers. Oh, the avionics went off again and I smell smoke. Okay, so now we have to go through each one of my avionic systems, you know, shut them off one by one until we can identify which one is my naughty, naughty avionic. But at least now we have the ability to try this. And of course, in the real world, in real emergencies, you know, there's panic and everything, but in the simulator, watch this, I can pause. So now I can actually take the time to go through each one of the motions, find the different handles I need, find the thing that goes ahead and switches the fuel selector to the other fuel selector option. Really take your time to feel the emergency out, figure out what you need to do for it, and then go ahead and be able to pop back over it. And again, once you start getting comfortable with the different kinds of emergencies that aircraft has, it's not going to be so weird for you later on. Item number nine. Try to see the airplane that you're interested in at an actual airport, or see it in person at a local air museum or something like that. Now, this particular aircraft that I've been tooling around with all day, yeah, I've got a very, very similar version of that that I've got some exposure to recently, which has been really, really cool, which helps make the connection between it and the simulator a little bit better. But again, if you can see one in the real world and then you see one in person, it really does make a difference as to what kind of fuel you use. Which brings me to my final point. And that is to fly the aircraft that you're trying to learn as much as possible. Find yourself an excuse to fly this airplane. Look for places where it's like, you know, I, I've got a couple minutes. Maybe I'll rip through the pattern again real fast. You know, maybe we've got a little bit of time and I want to try cross country. Uh, one of the things I always tell people to do when they buy a new payware is to run, take the plane and fly it until it runs out of gas. If you can still enjoy the airplane after that much flying on it, then you probably picked a winner. Uh, one thing I really like to do is to experiment with the plane in virtual reality, because it gives you a really, really good idea of the way the plane looks in the real world, and it allows you to kind of see things that you probably wouldn't see ototherwise. I mean, uh, once you've kind of picked the destination, you'd be amazed what you can do with this aircraft. Uh, just taking a look at this Mooney, uh, we just took off from a split airport, for those of you who are kind of curious, we're operating there. Flip on that automatic pilot, you know, get yourself comfortable with the different functionality over here. Um, the incredible thing here is if I wanted to do something really, really absurd, let's go ahead and grab the GTN 7. 50 is just a little easier. 
little bit of absurdity for you. Uh, oh, look at that. It all held the correct altitude for me and everything. That's awesome when that works that way. Let's see if it's going to work. I like this too. I don't have to change any of these numbers. They're all considered acceptable. Set that to normal. Let's go ahead and set that to go back to here. We'll CDI, GPS, and direct to EGLL. That sounds good. Woo! Helps if you do the correct number of L's. Heathrow. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Activate. Go over here, switch on the navigation hold, and that is 814 miles away. Now, you're probably sitting there going, well, I don't have time to go 814 miles. Remember, you can always break up a flight, too. You know, I can stop this. Uh, you have other options, too, uh, for those of you who like to travel by map. Uh, you can always go over here and accelerate time. You know, just kind of manage the engine, manage the speed, manage the altitude and everything like that on your journey over there. And believe it or not, even though this is a four-hour flight, we have enough fuel on board to actually make that entire flight, which again, allows you to really experience everything about this aircraft. Remember in the real world, when you fly little airplanes like this, you generally don't fly more than three or four hours at a time. So if you are going to do this, don't be afraid to just set it and forget it and come back a couple hours later and finish the last half of the flight. Otherwise, try to keep them a little bit more reasonable so you don't burn yourself out. So hopefully this video is helpful as far as uh, helping you kind of get the most and see how to learn a new airplane. Obviously, if you're dealing with jets, especially military jets, it's going to be a little bit different but at the end of the day is you have to find what makes the plane different and then you need to figure out how to land it and everything else is just procedural enjoy